We're glad you decided to check out this message by Seabreeze Church and hope that you benefit from it. We also hope that you would join us either online or in person on a Sunday. We have a nine o'clock live stream service online. And then we have in-person services on our campus at 9 and 1030. So again, we hope that you would join us and we hope that you enjoy this message. Well, I'm glad that I remember to get my name tag today. So every once in a while I forget. So I'm glad that that wasn't today. I also think it's pretty creative <coughs> to um, uh, appeal for help for the creative arts ministry by making a mistake on the creative arts slide. I think that, that really makes the point well. It's like, we're, we really need some help. We need people proofreading stuff, checking things out. So I don't think that was intentional, but it, it, it works as well. Well, good morning, everyone. Glad you joined us today. Last week, we started uh, this series, five-week series, new series on the gift of life. And I don't know if you noticed, this uh, made the news last month, but last month, there was a, a large amount of people that were rescued from Mount Baldy. There were 15 rescues, uh, 15 people that were rescued from Mount Baldy, and each rescue uh, cost $782,000. That's a lot of money to save, in some cases, just one life. But no one in any of the articles I read were suggesting that we shouldn't save that life because they're just not worth it. It's just not worth $782,000. No one was making that case. They were trying to just figure out, given the number of people that are now getting stuck up in Mount Baldy, how do we fund this? No one questions the amount of money spent because that's how valuable life is to it. It's the most precious gift of all. And we will go to incredible lengths and spend incredible amount of monies just to save one life. Now, in this series, we're taking a deeper look at this amazing gift. And we began last week, and I laid the foundation, really three premises that are going to be at the foundation of everything we say in these next four weeks. So I want to just recap, in case you weren't here, what our foundational assumptions or premises are. Number one is that life is a gift from God. Our understanding is that Life is not just um, the function of time and chance, but it is uh, a gift from the God who created everything. And that really changes our understanding of the value of life and how this gift should be handled, or even if it is a gift. Premise number two we looked at last week is God's words sustain our life. Uh, what's true of every form of life here on earth is that it is dependent on something. It, it requires some resources, nutrients, water, something, air, in order to survive. The only kind of independent life is God. All other life is dependent on something. And because we are made in the image of God, we not only are dependent on food and water and air and other things, we are, at a soul level, we are dependent on God's words. His words sustain our life. And what that means is that his words then form kind of a, a habitat boundary for the region in which we thrive, our kind of life thrives. The third premise is that life is a partnering gift. We don't just stand off to the side and watch new life suddenly appear. We are given the great privilege of being co-creators with God. And so we're considering the ways in these next four weeks in which God invites us to partner with him in this amazing gift of life. Today we turn our attention to the place where this co-creation occurs, and that is the act of sex. Now, biologically, sex, of course, is the event in which a sperm fertilizes an egg and the miracle of new life is begun. But sex, for us as humans, is much more than just biology. Sex is a, is a highly emotionally charged uh, event. It is full of all kinds of moral implications for us. And that's because God intended more than just biology when he gave us, as humans, the gift of sex. I read something recently by an Australian author. His name is Frank Sheed, and this is what he says. He says, modern man practically never thinks about sex. When he said that, I thought, yeah, we do. And then I went on to read this. <laughs> He might dream about it, <clears throat> joke about it, write songs about it, but he doesn't think about it. And I thought that, that, I think that's pretty accurate. So today we're going to think about sex. Not our thoughts. We're going to focus on what God thinks about sex. He's the one that gave it to us. We need to understand what he thinks about this. Now, last week, if you were here, I showed you a map 
of the habitat of the snowy owl. There was a snowy owl that migrated way out of its habitat, made its way to Cyprus and got some attention back in December. And we talked about how, like every living thing, there is a habitat. Boundaries that are drawn on a map, they're not fences that are seen on the ground, but they indicate the region in which the resources needed for that kind of life occur, and therefore that kind of life flourishes within its habitat. Now, you might not have noticed the smallest area of the map. It's at the very top. If you look at the key, that is the breeding grounds for the snowy owl. And this is true of all living things. There's a a zone, a habitat in which they thrive. But whenever you talk about the place in which their kind of life is reproduced, it's always much smaller than the larger habitat. Why is it the smallest? Well, it's because the conditions required for new life are always very particular. Life is a fragile gift. But new life is the the most fragile time of all. And this is why when it comes to new human life and the act that can create that new life, the Bible has so much to say about the boundaries that surround sex. That's because we are not just physical beings. We are moral beings. And therefore, these boundaries are moral boundaries. We are moral beings created in the image of God. This sets us aside from the other kinds of life forms here on earth. This is why we charge people with crimes and not animals. That's because we make moral choices and are therefore responsible for our decisions. Animals don't. They act out of instinct. But for us, we are capable. We have instincts, but we are capable of self-control. We are more than just instinct. And so for us, the most fragile part of new life is not the physical environment, the biology, but the moral environment. I mean, we can build shelters, and we've invented ways to survive almost anywhere in the world. But we do not have the power to invent or create or move our own moral breeding grounds without causing great harm to ourselves and to our offspring. Almost every week now, it seems like some new report comes out that describes some facet of the the struggle and the problems that are occurring in the youngest generations. And there are many different reasons, and it's a complex set of reasons, but what I have yet to see is anyone make the connection between the fact that we are moving our breeding grounds and we're just not making the connection between that and how it is impacting our offspring, why our offspring are suffering so much. Now, no one would deny that we are undergoing a sexual revolution, as it's called, in our country and in our world. What you may not be aware of is that this is not a new phenomenon. This is as old as human history. The the path that we are on as a culture and really in this world is a well-trodden path. There's moral history to this. And God describes this sexual migration away from the moral breeding grounds that he's established. He describes it in great detail in a chapter in the New Testament in Romans chapter 1. And so we're going we're gonna to look at this. This morning, we're going to listen to his words. And I'm going to offer some thoughts of interpretation. But I encourage you to do your own thinking, not about my words, but about these words out of the New Testament. Again, as I said last week, the words of the Bible are not just rules from God. The Bible isn't just God's rule book. This is our creator telling us the boundaries under which we personally and collectively will flourish and thrive. So what you're going to hear this morning, you're not hearing anywhere else pretty much. It's very different than everything you hear these days. And so I encourage you to not react to these words in the way that our culture has trained you to react, but to think about these words, to ponder them, and make your own decision. So we're going to talk about two things this morning. First, the first category is we're going to talk about, out of Romans 1, how this sexual migration away from God occurs. And then we're going to look at Romans chapter 2, which goes on to talk about how the migration back to God can occur. So the migration away, and then the migration back towards God. So first, the migration 
away from God. How does that occur? There's three steps. Step number one is we stop worshiping God. That's always step number one. Again, this is just not our culture. This is, this is an old playbook. This has been done again and again and again. So the step that we begin with is we declare our independence from our Creator. Now, remember, we are not independent beings. Our life is dependent, not just on food and water and air, but on God Himself. God is the only independent life, but we declare our independence from our Creator. This is described in Romans chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. It says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God, nor gave thanks to Him, but, in their, thinking, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So let's think through this. God clearly is invisible, as it says here. But what this is saying is you don't need to hear a booming voice from heaven to be aware of his existence. All you need to be aware of God's existence is to look at creation. There's plenty of evidence. If you just walk out the front door, look out, and look up. And there are two things that you will see clearly about God. It says you will see his eternal power and his divine nature. Divine nature means his, his mind. You know, the, the idea is that there had to be some intelligence behind the complexity of everything I see. Now, as I said last week, it takes a lot of faith. And I would add, it takes a lot of education to convince a person that there's no power or mind behind all of this. But you have to make your own decision on this. But if you can look up at the night sky or a sunset and think, this is just chance. There is no God. It's not because the evidence for his existence is weak. It's usually because there's something going on inside of you whereby you don't really want him to exist. You've already made a decision at a heart level for some reason. Even though deep down in your soul you know that God exists, you've decided not to honor him not to thank him for your life. You instead have decided to set your mind to build your life apart from God. You have decided to think <clears throat> about your life, not in the way that God says, not in a way that will give God honor, but to build your life entirely on your own, own efforts with nothing to thank him for. Now, don't look down at the atheist at this point. If you're thinking, how could people believe this? Because the truth is, we are all practical atheists in some ways. Maybe not declared atheists, but practical atheists. We've all taken more credit for our life than we deserve. We've all given God far less honor than he deserves. We've all done far more complaining than thanking. So whether you are a declared atheist or whether you act like one sometimes, we have all turned our back on God in some ways. And that isn't just a moral decision that has moral implications. It has thinking implications. It impacts how we think. Whenever we think with our backs turned to God, two things happen to our thinking, it says here. Our thinking becomes futile. That's the first thing. And then secondly, it gets dark. Our foolish hearts are darkened. First, it becomes futile. The word futile means to conduct an unsuccessful search to accomplish or try to accomplish something that you're not successful at. Now, to be clear, whenever someone turns their back on God and they decide, I'm not going to thank God for my life, I'm not going to worship and honor him, I'm going to live my own life on my own terms, whenever someone does that, their brains don't stop working. Their brains still work. The mind still works. We're still fully capable of th thought. We can solve all kinds of problems. We can even create successful careers. But it turns out that's not the, the search that our soul is really on. We are searching for things like purpose and deep and lasting joy. And without God, we can't think our way to those destinations. Our thinking keeps going around and around in circles and never finding what we're really looking for. That's what it means to be, have a futile mind. We think in circles. But it turns out these circles don't just go round and round in futility. They turn out not only be a circular thought, but a spiral. In other words, it's a third dimension. It, it, it goes down 
deeper and deeper into moral darkness. In other words, we become more desperate, and we become more willing to do different things to try to find what we're looking for. And that's why our foolish hearts are darkened. Over time, we resort to darker and more desperate measures to find the meaning and the joy that we're looking for. And that brings us to step two. We start worshiping sex. First, we stop worshiping God, and that eventually leads us to the worship of sex. There are some middle steps between that, but this is pretty much always where it goes. We were created to worship God, but if we're not going to worship God, we're now looking for some kind of God to exchange for the real God. We're looking for a different God. Romans 1, 22 through 25, the next verses describe it this way. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. They were thinking without God, became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth. Here's the exchange. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. We have the power to decide that we're not going to worship God. We have that ability. We've been given that freedom. What we don't have the power to decide is that we're not going to worship. We are going to worship because that's our nature. Being created in God's image means that we are worshipers of something. And that's because being made in the image of God means that we're kind of like shadows that must find something big enough that we can stand next to and look up to and serve in order for us to find any sense of meaning or purpose. And if it's not God, then we're going to look for something that is big enough to make us at least feel a little bit like we're, we have purpose and meaning in life. So we try to find God-sized replacements that fit the eternal size of being made in his image. Now, of course, there is no real replacement, but we keep trying. Now, the first exchange and the best exchange category is stuff in creation because everything in creation at least has the smell, the whiff, the leftovers of God's divine power. So it's the closest thing we can get to God. So we pick up something that is physical, something God has made to worship. Now, in ancient times, as this verse refers to, they they made idols of people and animals and birds and reptiles and celestial bodies in the skies to worship. Now, it's the same kind of thing today, only without the idols of stone. We have, as a culture, exchanged God worship for creation worship. Different items in creation, different aspects of creation, but it's the most common replacement. Now, this migrating journey of godless worship always makes its way eventually to the worship of sex, and usually they're intertwined. As it says, therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their heart to sexual impurity. Why does it always end up there? Why worship sex? It's because sex is the most eternal event that we can experience physically. There's nothing like it on earth. It is the place where God has designed us to partner with him in the creation of not just another human body, but another human soul made in his image that is eternal. So sex physically is the closest way we can touch the eternal. That's why it's so powerful. And that's why it becomes eventually our chosen exchange. Sex for us is an act of worship in which we reflect the three-in-one God by becoming two-in-one with another person in the act of potential co-creation. I don't know if you're aware of the old marriage vows, but they say it pretty well. 
This is one of the lines in, in a set of old marriage vow, vows. The, the two people are being married, state to each other this, with my body, I thee worship. And it's a real accurate description of what sex is for us. But when sex becomes the center and not God, when sex becomes the object, the central object of our worship, what happens is our bodies are degraded. All that God intended for us to be physically is, is, is brought down. It's degraded. What does that mean? Well, if our bodies become the focus, if the act itself, the physical experience itself, becomes the focus, which is what worship of sex is, then it diminishes our soul, the real core of who we are. And what happens is we end up objectifying each other as objects, not people, but as objects of desire, objects to possess, to experience. Now, probably one of the biggest evidences of the worship of sex in our culture right now is the porn industry. It is the, the ultimate objectification of sex, the selling of sex, the images of sex for personal gratification. Now, it's tough to come up with the amount of money the porn industry makes because the nature of porn is they're not really well regulated, they don't report very well on their sales. But the estimate is the porn industry generates, and this is a conservative estimate, the porn industry generates $100 billion a year in this nation. $100 billion. Now, let me just put that in scope. That is more than all of the professional sports combined. We just watched the Super Bowl. The NFL is the biggest professional sport. I'm not just saying porn makes more than the NFL. I'm saying porn makes more than all of the professional sports. The NFL, basketball, hockey, soccer, golf, all of them combined. Porn turns sex into a commodity and those bodies into objects and they are diminished. People made in the image of God who are real people and have value beyond what they look and how they can make a person feel. Their bodies are degraded and the person using that image to gratify themselves is degrading their bodies in the process. Everyone is degraded in that process. Now notice the phrase, God gave them over to this. That's a very interesting phrase. The idea is, is that God is helping us stay within the boundaries. He's helping us gain self-control. He's holding us back. The idea is that sex is so powerful that we really need God's help to handle it. But if we keep chafing against that long enough, God eventually just says, Okay, it's what you want. I'm going to let go. If we turn from God, he lets go, and we end up going down the sexual rabbit hole. That's step three. Sex becomes our God. Sex then becomes the central thing about us. It becomes our obsession, our focus. It, it dominates us. And the reason is because sex obviously, is not God. Sex doesn't have divine power. It was created by God, but it, it isn't God. It doesn't have divine power. So because it doesn't have the power, we have to expand it to make it as God-like as possible. And we give more and more of ourselves over to it. It goes on to describe the next verses this way. Romans 1, 26 to 27. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women have exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Now, throughout history, the deification of sex has always led to sexual activity that has absolutely no chance of creating new life. This is not new. This is... Oh. Now, these are God's works. 
These are not mine, and they are very clear. This is not hate speech from God, as our culture would say. This is the God who created us and sex, speaking words of truth so that we can migrate back towards him and experience the kind of life that we were created to experience. But this is where our culture is now. So now let's turn our attention to how do we migrate back towards God? This is Romans chapter 2. Now, when the Bible was written, there were no chapters, there were no verses. Those were added later so that we could find places. But chapter 2 of Romans is not a whole nother thought. It is a continuation of these verses that I've read. So Romans 2 verse 1 follows after what I've said. So step number one in the migration back towards God is this. We stop judging each other. We stop judging each other. You know, the hate speech that I mentioned, that concern, that's a real one. So God addresses it. Romans 2 verse 1. You, therefore, have no excuse. He's talking to all of us. You who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge the other, you're condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment, you do the same things. See, the tendency is to use the information from Romans 1 and to start shaking our head and say, yeah, people are awful. And to look down on the sexual sins of others. But God says, you really don't have the moral ground to do that. Yes, it's wrong, but you're not in a position of judge. Because why? You do the same things. Is that true? When it comes to sexual sins, yes. Not the exact same things, but the exact same kind of things. We've all worshipped sex over God. It may, for you, be porn. It may be just the lust in your heart. It may be an affair now or in your past. It may be, as we just read in Romans 1, same sex but we're all guilty. Jesus made this point about sexual sin very clear in an experience, not just a teaching, but in an event. When a woman caught in adultery was brought to him for judgment. She was caught in adultery. She was involved in sexual sin. The law at the time called for her to be stoned. So the rumor was Jesus was all about forgiveness, and they thought they could trap him and make the accusation that he's soft on sin. So these leaders brought her to Jesus to see what he would, how he'd respond. So here's what Jesus did. It says, but Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. It doesn't say what he wrote. So you kind of have to guess. And I'll say, this is my guess. I'm not sure. My guess, based on what happened after this, is that he was listing some of the sins of the men who were standing there having brought her accused. I think he was probably listing some of the sexual sins. I don't know, but that's what I think. Then, having written down whatever he wrote down on the dirt, then he straightened up and said to them, if any of you is without sin, and you can see that you're not, Let him be the first to cast or to throw a stone at her. What's his point? Okay, if you want to condemn people for their sin, let's address all the sin in the room. I mean, we're going to stone for sexual sin. Let's start throwing stones at each other. Let's get get it all dealt with. If you're that serious about sin, then it shouldn't be just hers you're concerned about. It should be his and his and your own. So at this, the next thing, those who heard began to go away one at a time. I love this part. The older ones first. (laughs) Why the older ones? Uh, Got a longer list. Then it was just Jesus left. Oh, so the older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. So it was just Jesus left with her. All of her accusers had slinked off into the, into the day or night or whatever it was. 
So it's just Jesus there with her. Jesus, the only one with no sin on his list, and therefore the only one who really had the right to be her judge, who really had the right to condemn her. So what does Jesus say? Jesus asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. I don't know all of why this woman was in the situation she was in. It could have been a long-standing pattern for her at this time in ancient history. If your husband died or if you were destitute, prostitution was almost the only way you could survive. I don't know all of the reasons why she was in this situation. But I can just imagine when she heard Jesus declare that he didn't condemn, I just, I imagine tears just started pouring down her cheeks. I don't know. But those were not the final words of Jesus to this woman. What were the final words? What does he say next to this woman? Go now and leave your life of sin. You don't have to be this person. You don't have to live this way. He knew that her best future would happen only if she left her life of sin. He loved her, but he did not approve of or celebrate her lifestyle. The reason is that he loved her. He wanted the very best for her, and this was not the best for her. So step one is we stop judging each other. Step two is we start being kind to each other. Romans 2, verse 4. It talks a little bit more about the judging theme than in verse 4. says this, Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness? Speaking of God's kindness. Forbearance and patience. Not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. Saying, if, if you want to keep judging people, you're showing contempt for how kind God has been to you. If every time someone sinned, lightning struck from heaven, and they were struck dead, then we would all be much more serious about sin. But instead, we sin, other people sin, and there is no lightning. Life continues on. Why? God is amazingly kind, which is the only reason we're still alive. Some people decide it doesn't, God doesn't really care what we do. That's not the case. It's his kindness. Now, kindness is not the same as agreement. If kindness was agreement, then I could never be a parent. You know, if kindness to my kids meant that I had to agree and let them do whatever they want to do, then I can't be a parent. I couldn't lead anything. I couldn't lead a business. I couldn't... Is it, if, you're going to be, if kindness is agreement, I couldn't even think because I have to agree with everyone to be kind to them, then I can't even have my own thought process. Kindness is not agreement, as our culture tells us right now. Kindness shows up in how we treat people. Why is God kind? It says here that his kindness is intended to lead us to repentance. The word repent means to turn around, to head back to God. Now, does that sound like that would work? I'll admit, to me, at first glance, it sounds like I don't think that's going to work. I mean, if someone disagrees with me, how is me smiling at them going to change their mind? I mean, I'm a talker, so I'm thinking, I I'm going to have to state my case. That seems to be the more effective tool of change to me. Well, I've tried that. You, have you tried that? probably, <laughs> made our case to those who disagree with us about something, what happens? Do they see the brilliance of your logic and say, oh, of course. I, I can't believe I thought what I thought before. No, I haven't, I don't think that's ever happened to me. <laughs> Usually what happens with someone who disagrees with me, if I present my case, they present their case. And we both dig in. No one's changed. Why? Change occurs at the heart level, not at the thought level. And that's because we are not as rational as we'd like to think we are. The way our mind works is this. Our heart, sets, sets our, our heart is set on something, and then our mind goes to work to justify it. That's just the way we think. So God knows that we're probably not going to think our way back to him. There'll be thoughts involved, but that's not going to be the lead. We're going to have to experience our way back to him. You see, whenever we turn away from God, life gets hard over time, harder. And in that pain... 
we're open for a change at a heart level. Now, let me ask you this. When you are hurting, who do you turn towards? People you've argued with or people who have been kind to you? People who have been kind to you, even if they disagree with you. Repentance is a change of heart, and that occurs in the environment of kindness, not anger. Last step back to God is we repent of our sins. As I said, repent means to turn around. We deal with our own stuff, and there's lots to deal with. I'm going to, make, I'm going to say this statement twice because I want you to hear this. Repentance is the work that's required to grow kindness. Because this doesn't necessarily make sense. Hopefully it will in just a moment. Kindness is the work that we have to do to grow kindness. Kindness doesn't just bubble up in our hearts like our culture would like to think. We would just kind of naturally be kind. No, that's not who we are. Kindness is an experience that we pass on. When we've been treated with kindness, we are more likely to treat other people with kindness. And if you have a deep awareness of how kind God has been to you, then you'll be able to be kind to others. So let me ask you, how kind has God been to you? Your answer depends on what you think you deserve. If you think you deserve whatever other people are getting, then you're going to be able to find a number of people that have more than you, and you're going to tend to feel like you're getting less than you deserve, and you won't think God's being kind to you at all. But if, on the other hand, you understand the real nature of things, you realize that every single sin you do separates you from the God who sustains your life, you'll be amazed. The older you are, the more amazed you'll be by the great kindness of God that has kept you alive this long. You know, we take this life for granted, but it's when we see the depths of our sin and repent that our gratitude grows and our kindness grows because we've received it from God. So I have a practical step that I want to invite everyone to take when it comes to addressing the type of sin we've been talking about today, which is sexual sin. It's an app. You know, it's always an app. So here's an app. (laughs) This app is called Overcome. It's actually called Overcome Porn. Now, you may be saying, wait, 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 wait. I'm not struggling with porn. I'm not saying you are. I mean, statistics indicate 60% of you are. And just because it's inside a church, the stats don't change. But this is a 40-day devotional focused on addressing porn addiction. But I think it's one of the best collections of verses and writings about the overall topic of sexual sin that I found. And the truth is, we're all sexual sinners. For some, as I said, it, it is pornography. Of course, pornography is just the gateway drug. But whether that's your struggle or not, I encourage you to download this app and use it for the next 40 days to deal with whatever your own sexual issues are. To think about sex. So, husbands and wives, if you see your spouse with the Overcome Porn app, (laughs) don't jump to conclusions. Your husband or your wife has a note from his pastor that says he can use it, okay? (laughs) So we're going to use it just to really deal with this area, honestly. I want to close with a verse that I read almost every morning, think through, because it is so encouraging to me. Lamentations 3, 21 through 23. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. When I read the news, I never have hope. When I look out of my culture, I don't have hope. But yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. In other words, we're not dead. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. You know why they need to be new every morning? Because we've used them all up every day. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The implication is that every morning you wake up, it's because God has been kind enough to extend his mercy to you yet another day. Life is not just a one-time gift. It is an everyday gift. So let's thank him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our beating hearts, our lungs that are working, our life. God, we confess that we 
um, live in a sinful world, and in particular, we've been raised in a sex-crazed culture. And therefore, we all, in different ways, have turned from you and have exchanged the worship of you for the worship of sex in some way. And God, that has degraded our bodies. It's degraded us. So I pray for everyone in this room that you would, you would help us to migrate back towards you, to not judge others, to be kind, and to repent of our own sins. Help us, we pray. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.